Good morning, and welcome to this week's edition of Encompass Live. I am your host, Krista Burns, at the Nebraska Library Commission. Uh, Encompass Live is the Commission's weekly online event where we cover any sort of activities that may be of interest to Nebraska librarians. Um, we do, we have guest speakers that come in sometimes, and we have our own staff, as we have today, doing sessions, so we have mixture. Um, we do these sessions every Wednesday morning at 10 a.m. Central Time, the last about an hour, or however long it takes, um, and they are free. And we also record all, each of our sessions, so if you aren't able to attend um, one of our live sessions here at 10 a.m. on Wednesdays, you can always go back and watch any of the recordings we've done over the last two years. Um, we do a mixture of things for our Encompass Live. We have interviews with people, book reviews, uh, mini training sessions about things, um, anything that we think, as I said, would be um, inter of interest. And this morning, we actually have our cataloging librarian here at the Library Commission, Emily Nimsikant. Um, who's going to talk, tell us all about um, using Ferber for cataloging. Great. Thanks, Krista. Yeah, I'll pass over control to you. Excellent. And thank you all for attending. It looks like we have a pretty big crowd here today, <laughs> which is excellent. Um, I think that Ferber is kind of a hot topic these days. Mm. Um, I assume that most people are, actually, I think I can say pretty well for sure that most people are interested in Ferber because of its relationship to RDA, Resource right. Description and Access, the new cataloging rules that are currently being tested. Um, I'm going to spend a little bit of time today talking about explicitly about Ferber's relationship to RDA, but I'm not going to spend too much time on that because I really wanted to talk about Ferber itself and really give it the attention it deserves. You know, every time I do a training session on RDA, I talk a little bit about Ferber, but I feel like I'm kind of glossing over it, and I think it has some merits in its own right. And I also want to spend some time talking about Ferberized so-called resources mm -hmm. where some of these principles are put into action because I think that's important for people to see resources using Ferber and what this theory looks like when it's in use. I remember when Ferber came, first came out, it was the big thing and everyone was talking about it and trying to learn about it, but now that RDA has kind of overshadowed it. Yeah, because exactly. Because it's the newest thing that everyone is panicking about figuring out how to use. <laughs> right. So, so yeah. yeah, I think it deserves some of its own spotlight <laughs> for Ferber, so that's what we're going to focus on today. Or the space bar. There yeah, we okay. go. Okay, so just the very, very basics. What is Ferber? Well, first of all, I'll start out by saying what the acronym stands for, and that's Functional Requirements for Bibliographic Records. Some people just refer to it as FRBR, some people pronounce it as Ferber. And here's a very basic definition of Ferber. This comes from Wikipedia. It's a conceptual entity relationship model that relates user tasks of retrieval and access in online library catalogs and bibliographic databases from a user perspective. I know that's still probably not <laughs> extremely clear, so we're going to break that down into a couple of different sections and look at different components of that definition. First one is a conceptual model. Ferber is a conceptual model. So what does that mean? Um, basically, it's an abstract way of thinking about a particular topic, in this case, library catalogs and how we organize our resources so that our users can find them. It's not cataloging rules. It doesn't tell you exactly what to transcribe or how, you know, what information we're showing to our users, but it, it sort of is one level up from that in terms of abstractness, I guess. Um, and so I, this is kind of a weird concept for people to wrap their brains around sometimes. You know, we're used to thinking of much more concrete things, AACR2 cataloging rules. But I don't think that the idea of a conceptual model is completely foreign to cataloging. I think, you know, you can sort of think about it in terms of things like cutters, objects for a catalog, you know, that our users should be able to find things if you search by author, title, or subject. You know, we have sort of these underlying principles under our cataloging rules already, and Ferber kind of makes them explicit. Um, it's not a perfect analogy to compare cutters, objects to Ferber because cutters, objects can be summed up very succinctly and the Ferber document is like 140 pages, I think, so perhaps a conceptual model is a little bit more complicated than some of the, you know, sort of abstract ways we've thought about our catalogs in the past. But I don't think it's an entirely unfamiliar concept that underneath our rules there are bigger concepts at play. So I'm going to start with a uh, history of Ferber, and it's not actually as old as this photograph. <laughs> um, <laughs> Ferber grew out of a seminar on bibliographic records held in Stockholm in 1990, so I guess it's about 20 years old, or at least the very seeds of Ferber are about 20 years old. At this seminar, a resolution was passed that a study be commissioned to define the functional requirements for bibliographic records in relation to the variety of user needs and the variety of media that we find in our catalogs. As you can see right there, I've highlighted the term functional requirements for bibliographic records. This is where that grew out of. 
So after the seminar, a group was formed in 1991 um, under the auspices of the International Federation of Library Associations and Institutions, or IFLA, and they were the ones who were going to carry out the study and define these functional requirements for our bibliographic records. And it took a while. Ferber, the report was approved in 1998 or 1997 and published in 98. You can find out about those. So, and that goes for any of the links I have in my presentation here. And like I said, I think it's 140, 150 pages, something like that. So, but it is all available freely online. Thanks. Um, just one last thing I wanted to say while we're still talking about the idea of conceptual models is that there are two other kind of complementary related models that go along with Ferber. The Functional Requirements for Authority Data, or FRAD. Um, obviously, Ferber deals with our bibliographic records in our catalogs, and FRAD deals with the authority records, the information about the authority records in our catalog. Mm -hmm. um, there's also a really new model, I think it was just approved this year, Functional Requirements for Subject Authority Data. And that one doesn't have quite as catchy of a pronounceable <laughs> acronym. I don't think anybody says for sad or anything, but it's out there and it will be incorporated into RDA as well. And that obviously deals with subject headings and subject data in our catalogs. Why that one took this long to do? I know, exactly. I, I would have thought that would be the, a very important one to get out there. And yeah, I kind of thought they would be all working on them simultaneously yeah. or something, but who knows <laughs> where these decisions are made. <laughs> IFLA works in mysterious ways, I guess, but it is out there. It's brand new and so be aware of that as well. So I'm going to go back to our uh, Wikipedia definition of Ferber here and highlight another phrase, and that is that we're thinking about our catalogs from a user's perspective. And that is one of the big things to take away from learning about Ferber, that this is all supposed to be oriented around how users interact with our catalogs. And so there are things in Ferber called user tasks. And this is an acronym you'll see pretty often when you read things about Ferber, F-I-S-O, that stands for find, identify, select, and obtain. And according to the Ferber model, these are the things that our users want to do with our catalogs. So I'll go into a little bit more detail about each of these. These are the definitions from Ferber. Um, they want, users want to find entities that correspond to their search criteria. So here's a screenshot of a search I did in our neighbor, Lincoln City Libraries catalog for Abraham Lincoln Vampire Hunter. And these are the search results. I put in a search and I found these results. But users also want to be able to identify which of these results will work for their needs. You know, as you can tell, not all these results are actually for the book Abraham Lincoln Vampire Hunter. So I've highlighted with red arrows the three ones that are. So I've identified those as the resources that I want. And then you want to be able to take it one step further and select the entity that's appropriate to your needs. You can see I've zoomed in on some of these results. The top one is the print version of the resource. There's also the downloadable audiobook, and there's the compact disc audiobook version. So I would say these attributes, kind of the physical format, is one thing that would come into play when a user is selecting which one that they want. And the last one is to acquire or obtain access to the actual resource. And so, you know, the information about which of the branches at Lincoln City Library hold this book that I'm interested in would allow me to obtain that book. So there's one last phrase that I want to highlight again from this basic definition, and that's the fact that Ferber is an entity relationship model. And an entity relationship model kind of comes from data processing, data modeling world. It's a way of thinking about information and how things relate to each other. And obviously one of the main components of an entity relationship model is entities. And so entities can be defined as things which are recognized as being capable of an independent existence. So basically things that can be uniquely identified. So a person can be an entity, a thing, you know, even an abstract concept. Love can be an entity. It's just the, the things that you want to identify with your particular entity relationship model. Um, and so you can tell from the name that entities and relationships are obviously important in entity relationship models, but entities also have attributes. So that's another important component of these models. And attributes modify entities. You can kind of think about it like as adjectives are to nouns, attributes are to entities. They tell you things about the entities, you know, in terms of our catalogs, the attributes of some of our entities would be, you know, title of a book, you know, mm -hmm. things like that. 
and these same entities with their attributes also have relationships and basically these are just links between entities the ways that they relate to each other so you know the relationship between a book and its author would be that the book is created by the author so is created by the relationship in that instance and in Ferber there are three groups of entities groups one group two and group three very basic names here which they keep it simple, I guess, but it can also kind of get confusing when you're thinking about which groups we're going to talk about. So I'm going to go into these in a bit more detail. And I'll focus pretty intensely on the group one entities because I think those are kind of the most unusual entities, the ones that people who are not familiar with the library world kind of have a hard time wrapping their heads around. Um, the group two and group three entities are terminology we already know, but the terminology for group one entities is a little unfamiliar. So the group one entities are defined as products of intellectual or artistic endeavor. Basically, the things represented by our catalog records, books, pieces of music, you know, DVDs, things like that. And here's another acronym that you'll see very often when thinking about Ferber, W-E-M-I or WEMI, WEMI, I think it's pronounced sometimes, but the four group one entities are work, expression, manifestation, and item. And these are four different ways of things that are represented by the records in our catalogs. The first one, the work, is defined as a distinct intellectual or artistic creation. And this is a very abstract idea. It's not represented in physical form. It's, you know, you could say if the idea of the Great Gatsby as it existed in F. Scott Fitzgerald's head is a work, but it's not represented in anything that you can refer to physically. The expression gets a little bit more specific. It's a specific intellectual or artistic form that a work ta takes. We say that works are realized through expressions. It's still kind of an abstract concept. It doesn't refer to a particular physical thing you can point at, but the example I often hear given of different expressions is translations. So um, the great, to continue my example, the Great Gatsby in English would be one expression, but if it was translated into Spanish or German, then that would be a different expression. So then when we get to the manifestation, that is the first time we're actually talking about physical objects. The expression is embodied in a manifestation. It's the physical embodiment of an expression of a work. And another way that I've heard it defined is a manifestation is a representation of a set of items with the same physical characteristics. So you could probably think of a particular edition of a book as being a manifestation. You know, the, I don't know, Scribner edition of The Great Gatsby is one manifestation. And, you know, I sort of tried to illustrate that with that, this image here. Is you can see there's various groups of books on the shelf, and you can tell that the ones next to each other look the same. There's multiple copies of the same manifestation there. And I always like to point out that really probably the bulk of the information that we're used to working with in our catalog records refers to the manifestation. A lot of things we're describing don't talk about one particular physical item. They talk about all the same copies of that manifestation. And so I think a lot of what we work with is manifestation information. And the last um, group one entity is the item. And this is where we're getting down to talking about one particular physical copy. It's a single example of a manifestation. So if you can hold it in your hand, I know I always hear people say if you can use it as a doorstop, it's uh, <laughs> an item. But you know, obviously it doesn't apply as well when you're talking about electronic items. You know, mm -hmm. that whole thing doesn't. But there is still the concept of an item when you're dealing with electronics. But it's one particular example of a manifestation. So as I mentioned, in entity relationship models, entities all have attributes that tell us things about them, and Ferber is no exception. The group one entities all have attributes, and I've just given kind of a brief example of each here. These are by no means all the attributes that go with each group one entity, but the title of a work is one that goes with the work, and that would be what we think of as like a uniform title that ties together different possible publications of the same work. Um, as I mentioned before, the language is something that determines an expression, so the language is definitely an attribute of, the, of expressions. Um, the dimensions of a particular edition of a book could be an attribute of the manifestation. And then 
when we get to the item, remember we're talking about one particular physical item. So if you have a copy in your library that has an inscription, it was signed by the author or something, then that could be a attribute of an item. So that is group one entities, and like I said, I'm going into a bit more detail about them than the other ones because the terminology is so different. But the group two entities should look a little more familiar, and these entities are responsible for the production of the group one entities. They're the creators of these products of intellectual work. Um, they're authors, composers, illustrators, you know, publishers, your corporate bodies fall into this, so publishers make this available. They may not be responsible for the intellectual content, but they're responsible for producing it and making it available. And yes, that center photo is a Lego F. Scott Fitzgerald. <laughs> is that it? Okay. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> it's like somebody lived it. <laughs> I found that on Flickr and I couldn't resist. So. <laughs> there weren't very many good author photos out there. Yeah. They're probably all under copyright and stuff. <laughs> um, there are two group two entities, person and corporate body. And in some previous training I've done on Ferber and RDA, I've also put the entity of family in there. And while I was putting this presentation together, I realized that that was kind of a misstep. Technically, in Ferber, family is not a group two entity, but it is included in RDA. They've decided that um, families can be creators of things. I think that's kind of a nod to the archival community who often has papers mm. produced by particular families and things like that. So that's it may be a slight change to Ferber that they made for RDA. But strictly according to the Ferber model, there are only two group two types of group two entities persons and corporate bodies. So there can be some changes that can be done to this based on now that yeah. RDA is getting out there and being used. But yeah, I think that's an important practice. thing to keep in yeah. mind. And, you know, people interpret Ferber in a lot of different ways. And, you know, it may, it's not perfect. It doesn't necessarily, mm -hmm. people are finding out that it doesn't necessarily describe everything that we mm -hmm. want to describe in our bibliographic universe. So, like I said, it's been updated several times since right. 1998. Since original, so, yeah. yeah, that's a good point. It can be changed. It's a good it's a good solid resource, but it's not totally in stone. Right. <laughs> Which is good. And so these group two entities have attributes as well. Um, I pulled out a couple of examples. One thing that you might think of as an attribute of a person is the dates associated with this person, their birth and death dates, and things like that. Um, corporate bodies have attributes as well. The place where a corporate body is located is a good example of an attribute of a corporate body. And then we have the group three entities. And these things are the subjects of the group two entities, the things that our resources are about. And so this can be almost anything. There's, you know, my five places, I have an animal up there. It can be at events like World War II. Actually, here's the whole list of group three entities. Concepts, objects, places, and events. And the group one entities and the group two entities can also be treated as group three entities because obviously you can have a work that is about another work or you can have a work that is about a person or a corporate body. So the group one entities and the group two entities can also be treated as subject entities, as these this group three entities. And I've said in the other slides that I was just showing examples of attributes. Um, for this one, they literally, according to Ferber, only do have one attribute. Um, all the concept, all the attributes for the group three entities are a term for the concept or a term for the place. And basically what they mean by the word term is, you can think of it like the authorized heading for a particular subject concept. Um, and so I assume that these attributes are something that will be more fully fleshed out in the functional requirements for subject authority data. I'm thinking mm. that separate model probably goes into more details. Right. But right now, as far as Ferber concerned, we just focus on a concept that's represented by a particular term, an object that's represented by a particular term. Those terms are the attributes. And so just we're still talking about entity relationships models here, so just to sort of address the other aspect is that obviously there must be relationships between these entities that we're talking about in Ferber. And there can be relationships between entities in the same group. So this is a pretty classic diagram of the relationship between the group one entities. A work is realized through an expression. An expression is embodied in a manifestation. And the manifestation is exemplified by an item. And you can see from the arrows on the end of these that some of these are one-to-many relationships. You know, uh, work can be realized through many different expressions, but each expression is only 
realizing one works. So the arrow goes, there's only one arrow in one direction, but other arrows, multiple arrows in the other direction. Um, you'll also notice there's a little recursive arrow up there on the work box because works can refer to other works. Mm. And there are many different types of relationship works can have. For example, they could be based on another work. You know, um, West Side Story is based on Romeo and Juliet, so they can have relationships like that. And then there are relationships between entities in different groups. There's a little bit more complex diagram. Um, you can see most of the arrows relating between the groups. For example, a work can has, have as a subject a group three entity. So there is an arrow going all the way down to the bottom to the group three entities. Um, or a work is created by a group two entity. So a person could be the creator of a work. Or, for example, an, a manifestation could be produced by a corporate body, which is a group two entities. So there's different ways of thinking about the various group one entities and how they relate to entities in other groups. I can see why people can be confused by it. Just yes, seeing it. <laughs> it is. It looks kind of overwhelming. Mm -hmm. So now I'm going to try and put it in some more practical terms. That was the big scary theory. <laughs> <laughs> and so basically I want to start talking about some of the questions I have up here on this slide. How is this different from what we've been doing? Is it different? Does Ferber really make a difference? And my answer to that is kind of yes and no. And I don't mean that as a cop-out, I promise. <laughs> um, to a certain extent, you know, Ferber just sort of makes more concrete things that we already know, things that we've already been doing in our cataloging. I think, you know, we all know that we can kind of see that works and expressions and manifestations and items exist. We don't necessarily think about it that way, but, you know, they all kind of fall under the catch-all when we talk about a book. We could mean different things. When you say, I cataloged that book, you could probably mm -hmm. be talking about the manifestation because you cataloged one edition that you have multiple copies of in your library. But if you say, I lent my friend that book, you could be talking about one particular item that you let your friend borrow. Um, but if somebody says to you, have you read The Great Gatsby? You say, yes, I've read that book. I mean, that's a more abstract level. You're not saying, yes, I read the Scribner edition of that book. <laughs> no, so, <laughs> so these concepts, you know, we use them. We, you know, we're just kind of maybe defining things more concretely, you know, really making this thing explicit. So in that way, I don't think it necessarily changes things that much. It just sort of helps us in thinking about it. Um, what I do think does kind of make a difference is the idea of relationships. And they exist, but Ferber goes a long way towards making them more explicit in the way we think about it. And I think it could really open the door to creating catalogs that link these relationships in a more useful way, maybe. I think that's part of what RDA is trying to do. And I, I don't know if it totally accomplishes it as well as the original intention was. Like there's a whole lot of things that get complicated with the rules and our encoding formats and you know, various things. But I think that Ferber really can make a difference by just making us think about the relationships between the resources in our catalog. And that goes back to the original thing about it's for the user. Yeah. Right, exactly. We want to make sure that we're making these relationships explicit so that our users can find things that they want. Um, I just want to throw some data at you here really quick. Uh, I looked around to try and see. I knew I know I'd come across the information somewhere that OCLC had done some research about Ferber and how it relates to the resources they have in WorldCat, the records they have in WorldCat. And the most recent thing I could find is from 2006. If anybody knows of any more recent numbers on this, I'd definitely be interested in hearing them. But um, as of 2006, for the records in WorldCat represented 87% of them represented works with only one manifestation, 12% um, were works with two to five manifestations, and only 1% were works with more than five manifestations, which looking at that, you might think, well, is Ferber worth it? You know, if we're trying to bring together different manifestations of an item so people can find all the related manifestations, is it worth it if 87% of WorldCat records have only one manifestation? But there's another way of looking at that data um, those works with one manifestation, they were 87% of the records, but they're only 43% of total holdings. Mm. Um, whereas the works with two to five manifestations make up 40% of our total holdings. And then there's a big jump from 1% to 17% with the works with more than five manifestations. So these are resources that people have, you know, even if they're not, you know, in sheer numbers in terms of the number of records, you know, these things with multiple manifestations are in our catalogs. And I think, you know, 
it does a disservice to the user to not necessarily make it easy for them to find all the related manifestations. So with that said, I'm going to take a look at some so-called ferberized resources. And um, there's, you know, sort of, it's not totally clear, but I don't think everybody applies the term ferberized in the same way. You know, it's basically I think it sort of generally means attempting to bring together related manifestations of a particular work or related expressions of a particular work. And it's accomplished in different ways. Um, you'll notice that the resources I'm going to show you aren't based on RDA. Obviously, you know, nobody's, not to the extent, you know, nobody's really full-fledged putting it into practice yet. So oh, right. the concepts of Ferber can be kind of realized without RDA, perhaps. But we were talking about OCLC, so let's take a look at worldcat.org. Maybe I should shrink that down so you can still see our webcam. <laughs> and we're going to wait for the website to load. <laughs> There we go. Okay. And I would kind of consider worldcat.org, the public face of worldcat, to be kind of a gently ferberized resource. I don't think it goes as far as some of the other ferberized resources out there. But let me do a search for my example from before, Abraham Lincoln Vampire Hunter. And I'm going to look for the book. And you'll see that, you know, plus one other format and you can expand it and it will show you that it has the audiobook also and so it's kind of OCLC's attempt to ferberize their catalog and I think it's mostly based on ISBN numbers they kind of have groups of associated ISBNs and mm -hmm. so they will show you the resources that are related to what you search for through ISBN If it does or if it's them, actually. Yeah, I don't know. Well, we'll try my here, next, I'm doing okay. <laughs> we'll try my next website and see if that works better than World Cat. <laughs> Still trying to. <laughs> it's thinking. It's working its way up very slowly. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. It's starting to come up on here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I may just have to give up on this one and. See what we can do. Yeah. Where's uh, that? There we go. Yeah, Thank you. <laughs> Too many tabs. Okay, so um, I mentioned that sort of the technology behind WorldCat.org and their ferberization is done with ISBN numbers, and they actually make their technology behind that available to people if they want to be able to do this to their own catalogs. It's called XISBN. And so they have an API where you can get the data to produce the programming to, so when somebody searches for a particular item in your catalog, it will bring up you know, links to related items that are... Let's, um, before we go any further, I want to see if we can get that WorldCat thing to like close it or because it's really slowing down oh, the, the connection and stuff. If we can get the whole, maybe just the whole browser to close. Okay. Or at least, yeah, there it goes. Okay. Now it should be easier. Okay. Okay, cool. It was really bogging things down. Yeah, it's yeah. affecting the sound that was <laughs> Oh, coming yeah, through. we don't want to yeah. affect the sound for <laughs> sure. Um, so this is something that's out there if you're interested in sort of ferberizing your own catalog. I think it's free for up to a certain number of searches per day, but they do charge if you're going to have heavier usage. Um, 500 requests per day. So I don't know if that means 500 people searching your catalog for this particular thing per day, but so that's something to explore if you might be interested in doing this um, to your catalog. Another th option that's out there is Thing ISBN, and this is available through Library Thing. Oh, cool. That's right. Yeah. And they do um, something similar, and I believe this one's totally free. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, let me get rid of this window here. I think. So you can see us again. Yay. Um, and there's this called Thing ISBN. Let me scroll down a little bit. It's a API, an application programming interface. And you know, if you have someone with the technical skills to install this on your catalog, you can go ahead and do that. And they say the format is identical to OCLC's ISBN, so it's a similar concept of relating ISBNs to each other. And I've seen an example of a project that uses it, the University of Huddersfield, 
which I think is in Canada, if I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm. And see, do a search. Oh, it says UK actually. Oh, okay. On the URL. I knew it was foreign, but yeah. Let's do a search for Pride and Prejudice. And so this particular edition, you see this other editions and related works. And so this is through linking ISBNs. They have a link to the ebook version, a link to a 1970 edition, and a link to a 2008 edition. So if you think there's something that might be useful for your catalog users, you can use one of these ISBN services to kind of create a Ferberized catalog. Um, one thing that I think that Ferber works well for is if you have a, there are particular types of resources that work better with Ferber than others, and one of them is music. You know, there can be a lot of different oh, manifestations yeah. of the same work in music. And so this is one kind of experimental project from Indiana University called Scherzo. And I'll do a search for Mozart in this interface. And so I, t I told it to search for anything with Mozart as the creator or composer. Mm -hmm. Let's see. Aha, mm -hmm. this display is funny with our window minimized like this, yeah. but um, you can see they have 4,000 and something results for every single item they have in their catalog that has Mozart as a creator. But up here they have this sort of, they have 803 work results. And so they've, what they've done here is group together various manifestations that represent a particular work. Because you might just be looking for a particular concerto and you don't really care which album it's on, but you just mm -hmm. want to know where you can find a concerto. And so if you click on that first result, now I know to scroll down, you can see it's on a CD called Trumpet Concertos famous horn trumpet concertos, so, you know, it's kind of, I think that music is one area in which Ferber is especially useful when we think about catalogs to search music resources. Yeah, yeah. Um, movie images, movies, films, I think is another area where Ferber can be pretty useful. Um, this just came out, I think, within the last couple of weeks. It's so new that they don't even have a catchy name for it yet. <laughs> <laughs> they just call it, this is put out by OLAC, which is the Online Audiovisual Catalogers, mm -hmm. and they just call it the OLAC Work-Centric Moving Image Discovery Interface Prototype. So... They need to come up with an acronym. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's just not catchy at all. And so this kind of does the same thing for movies and films that the Scarzo site does for music. Looks like this one's running a little bit slow too, but if I do a search for Dracula, and you'll see it has sort of what they call a work record up here, and they've said that they've sort of lumped together a work plus what they call primary expression, which is the first publication of it basically. Oh, right. So. Bram Stoker's Dracula, there's their work record, but then they have various you can get in VHS, Laserdisc, things like that, you know, other years mm -hmm. that other films were made about Dracula. So again, it's sort of just organizing resources under a uniting concept of a work. Mm -hmm. And another example is the Austlit catalog, which is through, it's from Australia. Um, I think it's a collaboration between the Australian National Library and some of their research universities. Mm -hmm. And it's available, I think you can access it in-site, on-site at the National, Australian National Library or for some of their universities, but you can't just open, access it openly on the web, it's through subscription only, but they have made some sample results available so that you see what it looks like. And it focuses on early literature, they're focusing on Australian authors, basically. So again, it's kind of a niche, a niche product. You can see that mm -hmm. I think a lot of people are ferberizing smaller groups of resources rather than everything out there. Yeah, get started with something easily manageable. <laughs> exactly. And so, for example, you can see some of their sample records are for works. And that I think they're also their intent is to show holdings in various Australian libraries, too. And so this is a work record. 
and then they have this work has appeared in at least five different versions. So these are more of the manifestations down here. So again, you can see it's sort of a trend in these interfaces that they have an upper part that refers to a work, and then they show you the various examples of the manifestations. Um, also, it kind of takes in another direction. They also focus on what they call agents, which are the creators of the work. You know, sort of the group two and the S. And then I think it's something to point out. I think that that's another thing that Ferber could do is that sort of make. Right now, you know, our catalogs are really focused on our bibliographic records, and everything else is kind of incidental. I think we can also start having maybe records compiled with data about our authors. You know, if you wanted to really you know, just look and see what we have available by a certain author, you could really get a much more user-friendly interface than what we currently have now when you search by title or by author, and it just brings up a list of all their works. You know, you, you can kind of it'll be more user-friendly to people who are interested in a particular author. And that's kind of what I wanted to show with the open library. Um, this resource, I don't think they go as far to verbalize the relationships between works and expressions and manifestations, but they do focus on making pretty explicit the relationships between bibliographic resources and the creators of them. You can, you know, search by an author, for example. So Salinger. And so they have, you know, a concept of author records. So you can go and find a page that's going to be linked to all of the works by this person, which is a little different than our traditional catalogs function. And they have the but same it's, thing. It's very useful, I think. I do this a lot because library catalogs don't always do it. I use things like um, either sometimes a author or a publisher has a website that does the same thing, everything by this author. Or like you mentioned, Wikipedia does that very well. Mm -hmm. as, as well, look up the author and find out everything they've done. Exactly. Yeah. So I think there's a demand out there. I think that if Berber enables our catalog to do this more easily, as Auslit shows, then um, I think that's a great idea. And um, Open Library also has pages for particular subjects. You can go and click on a page and search for, you know, a subject of Haley's Comet, and it will show you all the works that have to do with Haley's Comet. And so I think it's, it's kind of a new way of thinking about subject searching or searching in our catalogs. And mm -hmm. I think that it does kind of grow out of Ferber and it's emphasis on relationships, how you can, you know, approach things from the bibliographic resource and the things that are related to it, but you could also approach it from looking for an author and finding things that are related to that author. Okay, so as I promised, we are going to talk a little bit about Ferber and RDA. Um, I know that's probably the big topic on everybody's <laughs> mind. <laughs> so what does this practically mean for me? Um, RDA, as I mentioned, is Resource Description and Access. It is the new cataloging rules, which are currently being evaluated by the National Library. They have not officially been implemented yet. And they are based on Ferber and its principles. Um, probably the most obvious way in which you will see Ferber's influence in RDA is just looking at the terminology. This is basically the top level of the table of contents of RDA, and you can see that we're dealing with recording attributes, um, and then you can see a lot of the entities I'll mention there, manifestation and item, work and expression, person, family, and corporate body, concept, object, event, and place. These are all names of the entities in the various groups of the Ferber model. And so when you're done recording the attributes of them, they also want you to record the relationships. And for me, as I said before, one of the important things about Ferber is that it makes relationships between our entities, either our resources themselves or the people who created them or the subjects that they're about, it makes them explicit. And so the second part of RDA deals with recording these relationships. And as you can see, again, all the names of the entities are there in the section titles. And the sections dealing with subjects are not currently developed. As I mentioned, mm -hmm. the conceptual model for that just right. came out, so RDA did not take those into account, but I believe that it is something that is planned for future development should RDA be adopted. And I did want to point out that um, one of the tools that comes in the RDA toolkit is entity relationship diagrams for the various entities in RDA, which are based on Ferber. And so I think, you know, you'll notice it looks very similar to the little diagrams mm -hmm. I had going before with the entities and the attributes. And so you'll want to start thinking about all the things you record about your resources as attributes of an entity. The title is an attribute of a manifestation. The addition statement is an attribute of a manifestation. Things like that. They're, you know, they're called elements in RDA, but they're also called attributes. And so kind of getting yourself in the mindset of a 
entity relationship model is a really good thing for dealing with RDA. So those of you who have attended my presentations before know that I always like to keep my and you have a couple more print resources. All those ones before were available online. These are available in print, and we do have them in the collection here at the Library Commission. Ferber, A Guide for the Perplexed by Robert Maxwell, and Understanding Ferber and what it is and how it will affect our retrieval tools by Arlene Taylor, the editor. There's a bunch of different authors in that one. Yeah, you can tell from the title that a lot of people are confused by, by fervor, so you're not alone if it doesn't, if it overwhelms you, perhaps. So I just, so those are again some good resources that will help you understand fervor and why it's relevant to us. So, does anybody have any questions? I guess we're done a little bit early here. Yeah. Um. Um, I don't know, does anybody have any questions uh, for Emily at the moment? Either I explain everything really well or they're um. all overwhelmed. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Jen says, can you go back one slide? Absolutely. Um, sure that one? Jen, you talking about the one with the book titles? Yep, that's the one. Okay. I guess you want to take on the title. I guess that yeah. is the one that, you know, yeah, you can't link to afterwards, mm -hmm. so. Uh, well, we'd be able to find if there's WorldCat records. Oh, yeah. yeah. We can idea. link to the records for those in WorldCat or something, too, when we put up our um, uh, delicious links yeah, um, to, to the recording as well, so you can have access to that. But both of those I found to be really good. Um, the Ferber Guide for Perplex is a basic overview of things, and then understanding mm -hmm. Ferber kind of takes sort of there's multiple authors, so they take different approaches to things that they found relevant about Ferber. So it's kind of an interesting read as well. Okay, does it look like we have any urgent questions coming in? If you do have any questions after the session you come up with while you're trying to work with us, whatever, feel free to contact Emily here Absolutely. at the Library Commission. And like we said, the recording will be put up after the session is over, and all of the links that were in here will be put there as well. See if all of those resources, and when the recording is done, we will ha um, have it sent out to everybody who attended. So you will um, be able to. Um, we have a thank you oh, from Laura Hess. You are Laura. <laughs> um, I think it was very useful. Definitely a lot of you know. It's hard to explain. Definitely, it's not it is. easy. It's, it's not an easy thing. But yeah. thank you all for attending and being willing to learn mm -hmm. about it. Yep. No more thank yous. Thanks. Great job. Great. Um, I know we had a little bit of uh, technical sound issues when we were bouncing back and forth to yeah. some of the websites. Um, WorldCat, for some reason, just yeah. was not happy today. <laughs> um, but hopefully, normally those kind of things aren't so bad when the recording comes out. So we'll yeah. see how that comes. Um, so if nobody has any questions, it looks like at the moment. Um, oh, we had, it was a great overview of Ferber. Oh, good. So I'm glad. <laughs> that was kind of the point. Yeah, the idea we were hoping. <laughs> Excellent. Um, Hopefully, uh, we'll join us next. You'll join us next week, um, at least Nebraska people, um, where we'll have a, our session on scholarship and internship grant opportunities um, via the Library Commission. Um, we have some new um, IMLS grant program um, that. Uh, what do we got here? Internships that are. Um, are coming through. Yes, that's what it is. <laughs> um, so we're going to have some people from the commission talking about this and telling how this program is working and what's coming up with it. So hopefully you'll join us next week for that here on Encompass Live. Um, other than that, we have, oh, thanks for the training from Ruth. Oh, great. Ruth. You're welcome. Thank you for attending. Um, if there are no questions, um, then we will wrap it up and say thank you. And we'll see you next week. Bye-bye.